Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff Mo Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. Today, it is time for another edition of Female First. I guess this is the first one of 2021. Oh, yes, it is. Yes, which means we are once again joined by our friend and colleague, Eves. Hello, Yay, Eves. Why, Eves. hello. Well, you know, last time you were on here, you did a very good review of a horror movie you'd seen recently. Are there any horror movies you want to give a short review of oh, here at the top? Okay, you're putting <laughs> me on the spot right now. Okay, let me think if I've seen any recently. I'm actually, I haven't seen any horror movies recently. I've been catching up on horror TV. I'm just catching up on dark. So that's that's really like what's been on my mind lately. But I'm trying to think if I've seen a bad horror lately. Probably, but I can't conjure one. Conjure one. Ooh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> can't conjure one right now. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what about you, Samantha? Have you seen any bad horror movies lately? I mean, I'm sure I have. I keep rewatching the same ones. I, I did find that since I have HBO Max now uh-huh. and, you know, the Roku with this whole thing where you wouldn't have the Max part portion, yes. but now it's gotten together and that is thing. I have the Conjuring series. So oh. I started all of it because the last one, it's not the last one because I don't, I guess it's a James Wan movie. I don't know if it's a part of the series, but for some reason it's linked to it. It's like La La Reina? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, based on the, the folktale. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm I'm watching that. Well, I'm coming up on that because I was like, well, might as well start at the beginning, go through all the Annabelles, even though some of them are really awful. <laughs> and then hit that one as my like finale since I've never seen that one. Mm. So I'll tell you about it when I watch it. That movie came out. There were two of them by very similar names about the same folklore oh. that came out at the same time. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I've seen them both and they're vastly different, which is interesting. Which one's better? Probably not the one you're about to watch. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think the one you're about to watch is like, quote, scarier in that, oh. like, it's kind more of jump scares. scare. Yeah. yeah. And the other okay. one is much more like under your skin. Mm-hmm. Is this guy losing his mind or is there actually oh, something so going on? Oh, so that's the like psychological yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, if I'm remembering you. correctly because yeah, I, I've also seen a lot yeah. of bad horror movies. The Curse of La Llorona. Yeah, yes. I just remembered though, I, I had been watching, I think I told y'all that I had been watching classic horror movies um, lately. I had yes. a box set of those. I think last time I told you I watched Creature from the Black Lagoon. Yeah. Right, right. The one I watched after that was Invisible Man. So, oh. um, and that was a treat. Like, it definitely had its <laughs> moments. I feel like a lot of those, I have one-liner takeaways that are just very valuable <laughs> to Amazing. think about. I think that's too old to give, like, or not silly enough, I'll say, to, like, you know, give any sort of meaningful review that hasn't been done 190,000 million times before. But I enjoyed it. And, like, it's really fun to, like, watch horror that's so, so, so lighthearted by today's standards. Right, yeah. Even though they're so, so, so problematic in so many ways, like when oh, it comes yeah. to the treatment and depiction of women and and Black people. <laughs> but like, it's also very like, oh, wow, we, we went we went deep into the abyss within a span, <laughs> within a span of half a century. We went deep. Yeah. Right. We went yeah. deep, so. I feel like we need to do a whole thing about bad 80s movies, uh, horror movies, like the clown movies that they used to do all the time where they just had a person dressing up, chasing with a high-pitched giggle, like stuff like that, where it's like, it seems scary as a kid and you grow up going, what the hell? Gremlins is a prime example of that. You're like, what the hell is this? Or the uh, Leprechaun <laughs> movies. Oh my we should gosh. do. We should watch that as a as a team, y'all. Yes. Team activity. As a team, yes. <laughs> I have oh. activities for us, y'all. I mean, I'm in. I'm in. It'll be interesting because some of them, you go back and you don't realize like how messed up it was that you watched that as a kid. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I might have talked about this before, but yeah, the stigmata was one of the ones I yeah. saw pretty early on in the theater. Mm-hmm. And that was like, that's pretty intense. And now that I think about it in my today mind, thinking about <laughs> as a child, having watched that. <laughs> a kind of melancholy look. It's like a, a reflection. thoughtful melancholy yeah, just, look just passed over <laughs> each face. You couldn't see it, listeners. Oh, but it was a sight uh, to behold. <laughs> that pause was not an awkward pause. It was definitely a moment of reflection of like, yeah, <laughs> what have I done? Yeah. <laughs> I saw that movie very young too. I don't know. I think that's the that one of the troubled lines we we walk now of when you rewatch something that you might have loved as a kid or even like not necessarily loved but 
watched and then you go back and it's been like, you know, 15 years since you watched it and you're like, oh God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. But anyway, hard pivot before we get into this episode. I wanted to ask if any of you ever sculpted anything. Not seriously. Nothing that wasn't from like Walmart bought clay. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Like I think it, the best I've yeah. done was like a pot where you do the coil pots. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm yeah, talking yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I got you. Mm-hmm. You just made it into a coil and welded it up and then you smoothed it out before you put it in the kiln. And I remember doing that in like the second grade with my art teacher. But that was the best I, I've done. And then you paint it after yeah. it's, you know, fired. They're not going to give you like an actual, uh, what are those? Mm. No. <laughs> I don't know. She's making swirling motion. <laughs> you know, uh, oh, and I'm, this is really bad. For like ghosts where she's doing the whole yeah, pottery. The on kiln. The, oh, the wheel? I don't know what, those, yeah. I don't know what it's yeah. called. Don't I, I don't know the, the technical wheel. terminology. I'm so glad we're so artistic that we know yes. these things. Mm-hmm. Um, so instead of doing that with pottery, which is how people typically do it, smoothing it out, we did it the old school, like you made it into yeah. a coil, mm-hmm. you bring it up into a pot, and then you smooth it out. That's the only thing I think I've ever sculpted in my life. And it wasn't good. And it didn't hold water. Just so you know. (laughs) That was a disappointing ending. But I'm glad that you had the experience. Yeah. The lowest grade I ever got in, in my primary education years was in art in high school. My art teacher, it was like almost comical how much she hated everything I did. And we did have a wheel. So I got to use that. But one of the funniest experiences I had in that very dreary class for me was uh, we were sculpting something out of, I don't know if it was marble, but it looked like marble. And it was real slow going. And I uh, had chosen to do a horse. I don't know why I didn't really like horses. (laughs) I think it's because the ring had just come out and I was really into that movie. That's messed (laughs) up. But it was bad. It was bad. I I wish I had it and I could show it to you. It's awful. But she came up behind me and she's like, oh, is that a polar bear? And I paused and I looked at it and I was like, Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> and so I just let her believe that I was trying to sculpt a polar bear. And I, when you end it, did it still look like a polar bear? Oh, when yeah. You finished I, well, it? at that point, I changed my whole like, oh, direction. Okay. I was like, yes, it's a polar bear. That's the way I'm going to go with this. <laughs> and that was probably one of the higher grades I got. And then I also did like a. Um, I did a clock face, but it was like a human, it was like the drama tragedy face, and it, it was all dramatic. Um, I liked it. She did not like it. She said it was like too intense or something. <sighs> <sighs> but anyway, I wasn't good either. Uh, <laughs> Sounds like she was limiting your imaginative capabilities to me yes, from an outsider thank you. perspective. Thank you, Eve. <laughs> she also once like took off, no joke, like 15 points because I used chartreuse in a hmm. painting and she was like, everyone hates chartreuse. <laughs> wow. Wow. She really didn't like you. Yeah. Yeah. I suspect it's because my older brother really had a bad reputation. No offense oh, to my older brother who no. never would listen to this, but the teachers would always be like, oh, you're related to him? And it was, there was just like a cool oh. demeanor. <laughs> but I have no idea. It could be she just didn't like chartreuse. Anyway, I'm delving a lot to my personal issues here today. Uh, But we are talking about some sculpting and someone who is actually really good at it. (laughs) Who did you bring for us today, Eves? I brought Mita Vo Warwick Fuller. So there is a little bit of a segue between the horror conversation we were having earlier, as well as the sculpting conversation, because she was a sculptor. She was a Black woman. And she lived in the US, U.S. and in Europe. But yeah, a lot of her work was pretty related to the horrors of reality and the visualizations, the, the the imagery in her work was just, you know, very visceral, very real, very raw and, and emotional and expressive in, in many ways that was related to horrors and, and, and tragedies and, and things like that, even though some of her work was also hopeful and optimistic and inspiring and positive and uplifting and all of those other words that can be counters to things like (laughs) horror. But yeah, so she was the first Black woman artist to receive a U.S. federal commission. Her work is kind of considered a precursor to the Harlem Renaissance. She worked in the 19th century and in the 20th century, and she had quite a career that spanned over like 70 years. So I think there is a lot to talk about with her today, and I'm excited to bring her to the table. Yeah, this was another person that I unfortunately never heard of, and I'm glad you brought her to our attention. And I really loved her art, and I love the mm-hmm. quotes about, like, people would say the horror of her art, mm-hmm. and because mm-hmm. I am such a big horror fan. Right. So I really enjoyed 
learning more about her, and I'm excited to share her story with the listeners. I will say, as I was reading some of her articles, I like to imagine, because she did go back from Paris to to the U.S. a couple of times, and I'm like, man, she for all the bad things, I wonder what it was like to live in that time frame, which is mm-hmm. such a romantic time frame for to be in Paris. And again, like I know we'll talk a little more about it, but her coming back to the U.S. seems so sad. <laughs> yeah, it did seem sad. But I think there was also the harsh reality. And like you said, we'll, we'll get to it a little bit later. But there were a lot of Black artists who did go to Europe in terms of it being like an exit for them from the terror of the mm-hmm. United States at the time mm-hmm. and the terrorism in the United mm-hmm. States at the time. But also there were the realities that like, oh, white people still existed and mm-hmm. were still mm-hmm. racist in, mm-hmm. in Europe and, and, and all, non-white people as well, you know, who also harbored prejudices and, and stereotypes about Black people. So, you know, it's not like everything completely went away and, and you know, when Black artists went into exile or just left the United States to what they would perceive as better lives or better abilities to study, um, that they didn't have hardships as well. They still did. There is like an element of like fantasticness or mythology, I think, in the Black artists going to Europe. Like it is very like, this person lived in a cabin and this is the (laughs) cabin that they lived in while they were in France and they wrote this novel there. And that's how I think about those stories a lot of times, even though I know the realities of why they had to go there in a lot of instances. Right, yeah. I like that meetup, Vo Warwick Fuller's. Uh, story is, is part of that lineage of mm-hmm. people who did kind of go between the coasts or the <laughs> the sides of the ocean. Yes, yes, yes. Well, shall we get into her story? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so she was born in June of 1877. Her parents were William Warwick and Emma Warwick. He was a barber. She was a hairstylist. And that kind of continued throughout the family so that With her siblings, you know, they went back to be beauticians and stuff like that. And her brother was also a a physician. In an article by Velma J. Hoover, in thinking about how it was like to live as a child for Mita, Hoover said that she was part of, this is a quote, part of a special class of Blacks who were involved in catering and real estate business, which is just funny to me for some reason, like the phrase special class of Blacks. But yes, the idea is that the family was relatively well off. And she lived a generally sheltered, as Velma J. Hoover goes on to like talk about in this article, like lived a generally sheltered kind of experienced childhood in which she didn't spend a lot of time. Her mother in the, the beauty shop that she had had a lot of upper class white clientele. Even in thinking about that, Mita was named after one of her mom's clients, the daughter of the former Philly mayor, Richard Vo. So yes, yeah, she had two older siblings, William and Blanche, and... Like I said, her brother eventually became a physician while her sister became a beautician. And her parents encouraged an interest in art really early on when she was a child. And I think that's a through line through a lot of the people we bring, like particularly the artists. And sometimes I think we bring people who are more science focused as well. Like If their parents were around, had a big hand in the way that they inspired their children and encouraged their children to participate in that thing that they seemed interested in. And that was art for me to vote. Um, her sister was also interested in art, so she got to look to her for materials and inspiration as well. And she gained a little bit of interest in horror <laughs> at a young age, <laughs> just like you and I. And he, so her brother, her brother and grandfather told her horror stories, and she went to segregated public schools, and she ended up creating a wood carving that was in the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. And from there, it's just like art, 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 art for the rest of our life. (laughs) She got a three-year scholarship to the Pennsylvania Museum and School of Industrial Art, which I will absolutely abbreviate to PMSIA for (laughs) whenever we talk about this in the future in this episode, Mm -hmm. for brevity's sake. But yeah, so there she could earn a teaching degree, which, you know, possibly a reason that she could have done that could have been to appease her mother. The school was also a few blocks from where they lived. They had a home on South 12th Street. Yeah, so she attended PMSIA for about three years until 1897. She studied the beau art style, which was the style from France. And while she was at the school, she created a bas relief, which was composed of 37 medieval figures that was titled Procession of the Arts and Crafts. And it was a scholarship requirement, but it also won her a sculpture prize at the school. 
She got some prizes over her lifetime. You know, she worked a lot with the school and she really gained this interest in sculpture while she was there, specifically over other art forms. And I did attend a lecture that Framingham University did and a lot of pictures of her did show up in the 1897 and 1898, as well as the 1898 to 99 school catalog. So there are pictures of her actually in study, like um, looking at still lifes and, and creating her own work from there. So it's pretty interesting. If you're actually interested in looking at her work itself, you can see a lot of that at the Danforth Art Museum. Some of those images are online as well. And they also have a bunch of her materials, like her teacher certificate and diploma, as well as her studies and her process pieces, if you're interested in learning more about her work and just like stuff, like kind of feeling like a voyeur from the future, looking at like what it was like in, in the classroom where she studied in there and the clothes that they were wearing at the time. That seems so uncomfortable. Like that's the thing I always think about. I'm like, oh God, like, <laughs> I know how comfortable I like to be when I'm working and yeah, so if you want to see stuff like that, like that's available for her, fortunately, which isn't the case for a lot of people who, you know, the records aren't like that for everybody. So there is stuff that you can still check out from her today. But yeah, anyway, continuing with her story. In 1899, she moved to Paris to study. And in Paris, she ended up at the American Women's Club. I've seen it called the American Girls Club as well. But either way, she was refused lodging there because she was Black, ostensibly. And there were Southern women there who would object to her being there, is what they said. There are Southern women here who don't want you here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Which was, yeah, seems like diffusing the blame, but you know. Um, she was able to get lodging elsewhere, though. So, you know, she ended up staying in Europe. She studied under painter and... As I always give the disclaimer, my name is French, but I am not, and I speak no lick of French. But <laughs> Raphael Collin and Jean Antonin Carla, while in Paris, she studied under them. She also enrolled in the Academy Colorosi, and she studied drawing, went to lectures, went to museums, and did all the things that you expect <laughs> that you expect people studying art to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> So she also had support from painter Henry O. Tanner and W.E.B. Du Bois while she was in France. And Du Bois, um, there is like an anecdote of Du Bois talking to her and saying that he wanted her to focus on Black people in her art and really work on depictions of Black people because that's what he thought was needed and was needed from her as an artist. But she didn't want to do that. She didn't want to be limited in that way. And while she was, even though, yeah, as we'll talk about, like, Black life, Black culture, Black experiences is something that showed up in her work. But yeah, so she, you know, she kind of took that for what it was in terms of advice from Du Bois. But yeah, so while she was in Paris, she was in introduced to Auguste Rodin, who I think a lot of people know, even if you aren't super into sculpture, know his sculpture, The Thinker. This is the guy <laughs> sitting down with his yes. chin on his face. So yeah, so for this introduction, she took some of her work with her and she showed him her work and photographs of her work. And basically what it ended up was like, hmm, like, I like you, you know, I think you have a lot of talent, you have potential. I would like to critique your work, even if that means that I have to come to Paris. And so he was particularly a fan of her sculpture, Man Eating His Heart, which has also been called Secret Sorrow. And you can see a picture of that sculpture online too. It's also pretty expressive, like, not completely figurative in terms of, you can tell this is really a man eating his heart, but you can tell it's a man eating his heart. So yes, she would, <laughs> she would continue to seek advice from him for Rodin over the years, and he continued to critique and support her work. And as happens when you get big ups from big people in the art world, her work started to be more noticed as well. So she got more attention in France from art critics and art circles, and she got more attention internationally as well. But yeah, her work was shown in solo exhibits and group shows in France. And for instance, her work was shown in Samuel Bing's L'Art Nouveau gallery. And she had began really moving from this kind of decorative style from the Beaux Arts style and moving more into an exploring human emotion in her work and expression and suffering and in and, and sculpture. And she made that shift to those darker pieces that were a lot more expressive. For instance, in 1902, 
she completed a piece called The Wretched, which was a bronze portrayal of several people kind of writhing and suffering in different ways. It's pretty expressive as well, but you can also see that one online if you're interested. And for this reason, you know, she was working in the subjects and thematics that were moving into that horror space. People began calling her the sculptor of horrors. I love it. (laughs) Her success in Paris gained her the attention of people from all over the world, including the USA. So after being in Paris for three years, she ended up returning to Philadelphia in the early 1900s. She joined the Alumni Association chairing the exhibits committee and had alumni exhibits at PMSIA. But things weren't that smooth going for her when she was in Philadelphia and when she got back to the USA in general. It's not like everybody didn't welcome her with like this big warm hug, essentially. (laughs) She did face like difficulties when she came back to the US in terms of people actually supporting her work and paying her. (laughs) And local art dealers in Philly were rejecting her work, as it has been explained supposedly by them, um, that she was a quote-unquote domestic artist, but likely because of her race. Because you have to remember at this time, it's the early 1900s. And she had a studio there, and she continued to create. And at this time, you know, she was picking up a lot more of just being able to live, what, what it was like for her to live as a Black woman in the United States at the time. So in addition to all the European influences that she had from living overseas and, and studying the work of people who, you know, learn from these masters overseas, Black American life and culture started to influence her work as well. So she held exhibitions at her studio and continued to contribute to local art shows. And in 1907, she was commissioned to sculpt a series of tableau of Black American historical events for the Jamestown Tercentennial Exhibition in Norfolk, Virginia. I didn't know Tercentennial was a word until this, but I do now. <laughs> I didn't Me know it went beyond bicentennial. <laughs> now I do. <laughs> yeah, so that's her first. That's where we get to her first. That made her the first Black American woman artist to receive a federal commission. I gotta say, I'm loving the names of her pieces too, like the wretched man eating his own heart. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That sounds like poems I would have written. And and I I mean this in like, it sounds like an insult, but that's the kind of thing I was so into. Yeah. In in high school, I would write these poems like, the wretched and doom and all this. Yeah. And then they got published in the high school newspaper and it's my great shame, but (laughs) I must live with it. (laughs) Do you have those still? I do. You must share them. And Eves, let me tell you, there are drawings of like dark butterflies along the edges of these poems. Aww. That Did you that, do this too? Oh, yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> I didn't know someone else added that to yours just to give it a little more of oomph. No. It was um, me. <laughs> But uh, okay. Yeah, I love looking at the pictures of these sculptures because it's so beautiful and just the detail and the wave. She makes everything almost like aquatic in that level of like waves and forms of the material on them. The wretched in itself, it looks like a crashing wave of people suffering, which is really sad, but it's beautiful and detailed at the same time. It meshes so perfectly into whatever form it is. And I, I love that. I'm like, wow, I can understand. The names make sense because it makes mm-hmm. you feel that way, but its beauty is a whole different level of mm-hmm. that horror. So it is gorgeous. Yeah. Her work is gorgeous. And it makes me sad that uh, it's not more well-known. I mean, right. it is known, but it's not well-known, and it should be. She should have been as big as Rodan in that sense of, like, this conversation is huge. What she did and what she was sculpting was cultural. Mm-hmm. It's so gorgeous. Yeah, it is. Yeah, definitely clearly was, you know, very practiced and like really cared about the art form. And yeah, I agree about the titles too. Like, (laughs) I really like the titles and it's like they betray exactly, well, of course, their interpretations and like many different things you can derive from a work of art. But it's like, you know, she wasn't cryptic about the titles Mm -hmm. is what I'm trying Mm -hmm. to say. She was like, no, this is dark. And you're going to be able to tell that from the title even before seeing the the work. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. You know, like I said, she continued to create art, but she was also focused on her family life. She did have children. She eventually had children. In 1909, she married 
Dr. Solomon C. Fuller, and he was from Liberia. He was a neurologist and worked at a pathology lab as well. And they moved into a house in Framingham, Massachusetts, and they stayed together for many years. In 1910, her warehouse that she had all her tools in and her materials in for all of the work that she had done and while she was in Europe and in the U.S., that caught on fire. And so she lost a lot of that stuff, which clearly is like a huge loss for her. That's a huge loss for her in terms of the physical things that she had and and her inspiration, you know, just looking at your own legacy. I feel like it's so important to, you know, she had all those things there for her to go back and and look at for herself, but also share with, with people in the future, but also in terms of her being able to make money. So yeah, it was just, it was a loss for her physically, but I think also in a way where it's like, it affected her ability to continue to work in in her art form. She, for a few years, she was pretty quiet on the art front after that happened. And she already wasn't making a lot of money and was struggling on that front. But yeah, so that didn't completely eradicate her will to create art, though. You know, she she didn't stop forever. Du Bois did end up asking her to recreate one of her previous works, which was Man Eating His Heart, which we talked about earlier, for the 50th anniversary celebration for the Emancipation Proclamation in New York. She didn't do that, but she did instead create an eight-foot-tall sculpture of three figures called Emancipation. So it was cast in plaster at the time. Now, if you see it, it's cast in bronze now. That was done in, I think, 1999 and is in Harriet Tubman Park now. But It depicts people emerging from the tree of knowledge and is a departure from the more typical symbolism and imagery that surrounded emancipation at the time, like the breaking of the chains and the like kneeling to, you know, white, (laughs) white (laughs) abolitionists. And she, you know, continued to kind of create in the realm of social issues and of things that were happening around the world, like war and things that were happening in the United States. And in in Boston in 1914, she ended up showing new works in a public exhibition for the first time in several years. So throughout the 1910s and throughout the 1920s, she did create portraits of friends and family and self-portraits and continued to do commission works. And... She responded to a lot of those social issues through her work. For instance, she did anti-lynching pieces. So lynching was still like so rampant at the time in the United States during that time period. And she did one called Mary Turner, a silent protest against mob violence, which was a response to the just awful, 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 truly tragic story of Mary Turner, who was violently murdered because she spoke up against her husband's recent lynching. I mean... It's hard. Like that, that stuff is always hard to go through, like those stories, even though there are so many of them. But she specifically chose this story in which to respond to. And it's a pretty poignant piece. And it's just indicative of the things that she was thinking about and the whole, like, you know, Black consciousness and, and the things that, like, a lot of people were thinking about at the time when it came to racism and the interactions between. Um, white and Black people in the United States at the time. So yeah, she was also hard focused on those subjects through her art. And her work is kind of thought of as a precursor to the Harlem Renaissance work in which she wasn't specifically in the city, but she was still creating work during that period and she knew what was happening in the Harlem Renaissance. And I should note here, though, that not everybody was a fan of her work. (laughs) As to be expected, it's like, you know, not everything is everybody's cup of tea. But (laughs) for instance, in his book, The New Negro, Elaine Locke called her work, in addition to other people's work, has wavered between abstract expression, which was imitative and not highly original, and racial expression, which was only experimental. So clearly not a glowing review of her work, but he did end up praising her work, Ethiopia, or what has been called Ethiopia Awakening, um, which I think has been called her most known, most well-known or most popular work. Um, And it depicts a Black woman emerging from this kind of mummy wrap that resembles a piece of Egyptian funerary sculpture. If you look at it, you'll kind of be able to see the links between the two. And I think that that wrap and the emergence from it and the royal symbolism around it 
can depict so many things, you know, it, it, there have been, there's been scholarly writing on it and, you know, critics and writers talking about what they felt like it represented, but you can take from it what you will. But I mean, I think things that you can get from it are like rebirth, removing the constraints of the past while also acknowledging the past and kind of a nod to the evolution of Black Americans. So yeah, it could go on forever if we were to get into all of her like works because she, there really are a plethora of them. Um, even though some of them were um, lost, but she created a bunch of sculptures and continued to create into the 1930s and into the 1940s, much of that rooted in African as well as Black American folklore and culture. Yeah, and eventually her husband, he he fell ill and, and she, she did care for him, but he died in 1953. She also had tuberculosis and it took her a few years to recover from that. But even still, she did recover. She took more commissions and she kept creating works like Crucifixion, um, which was a response to the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham in 1963. I think a lot of people know that story as well. Well, I don't want to make any assumptions, but that in which four, four girls died. That was during an era of so much racial violence that was happening in the United States. So yeah, she died. Mita, Mita Vo Work Fuller, died in 1968 in Framingham and has been recognized since, even though she isn't someone who is a household name to people who are just not art enthusiasts or just kind of more general art enthusiasts at all. But she has been recognized in certain ways and, and her artwork is in public spaces and also is available to view at museums and online still. And, and like I said, we do have pictures of her herself, which I think is always a nice addition. But yeah, that's mm. the short of her story. <laughs> I would highly recommend any listeners go look up her art because it really is gorgeous. Yeah. I'm I was happy because a lot of times when we do these first, you're right, there's a lack of images. <clears throat> but there were like a lot of museums and school websites I found that had them. Right. Uh, so it's out there and we all recommend you go look it up. Her pieces are so gorgeous, but it also is so interesting to see her timeline from her beginning with her art stuff to that point towards her like the end of her life because how much she experienced and how much tragedy there was within, obviously, the uh, Black community in the U.S., but then all around the world and her like actually being able to do it through art, to show that timeline through art is phenomenal because between that 1918 lynching, which is so horrific and happened actually in the state of Georgia, it is so horrific yeah. and not talked about enough and why that was so horrific and acknowledging the fact that it was an atrocity to coming to the bombings, which is again towards the biggest part of the civil rights movement where things were happening and people were getting even more angry. Like, mm -hmm. it's just such an interesting timeline. I, I, and I would love to see, like, all of it laid out. I need to go to the museum. I need to go right now. <laughs> What's the pandemic? But, like, it's yeah. such a gorgeous tell of what she was thinking and what she was doing, as well as just creating for herself, like looking at her art, like the Ethiopia Awakening. That is a beautiful piece and very historical for her, but it's celebrating, was it a they called it the Black Pharaoh. Is that what they called mm -hmm. him? And I think that's amazing. Like she's celebrating these cultures, but then also grieving through her art, both of these things, and then trying to make a statement at the same time, you know, holding her art and her passion within herself. It's just like you just see the range of emotions. To me, I don't know. Maybe I'm just being really over the top about it and dramatic <laughs> about it as per usual, but mm -mm. just the level of what you see and just how it arises and being able to see that in her art is glorious as well as I think it's interesting for her to be keyed as the like pre-Harlem Renaissance. I don't know much about the Harlem Renaissance and I really should. Like, I know that as like the jazz era in my head. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's kind of a different turn to see these sculptures and it's also gorgeous to see as a part of that as well. Yeah, thank you for bringing up that that was in Georgia because I think that's one of those moments in which, you know, sometimes we're like, why are these stories so important for us to tell? And why are these people so important for us to lift, uplift in these times? And I think when I find connections like that, like it becomes very visceral to me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, Samantha, that you should apologize for being emotional about art because like one, like it, it's, 
it is expressive. You know, the, the work <laughs> itself is emotional, but also like you can't help the way that you respond to something. And, and if it, it really speaks to you in that way and that's your natural reaction to it, then that's totally understandable. I have cried in many a museum. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually love that. Like, I miss that. Like, yeah. I, I wish that this pandemic was over so I can cry in more museums. <laughs> right. Because I think it's it's really cool to be able to see her work online, but there are I do think that there is something to be gained from also seeing her work in person. And I would love to be able to, I don't don't think I have in the past, definitely not an exhibition completely dedicated to her. But yeah, so I think going back to the Georgia pieces where I started my train of thought starting on this is just that that moment of connection and saying like she didn't live in Georgia right <laughs> but she was thinking about things that were happening in Georgia at the time yeah and she was also highly affected by something that was happening on the same very same soil that I'm walking on today and have spent all, nearly the entirety of my life on so I right. think that that can kind of put things into perspective sometimes like even when a person's story seems like it's such an arm's length away from you or that, God, like another story about someone who was responding to like racism in the United States in the um, 20th century. But everybody's story is different. And right. I think that looking at it from her viewpoint and, and from a viewpoint of sculpture and, and knowing what she was able to do, despite the haters, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is very valuable. Right. I agree. There are so many things you think, oh, and it's that closely and how... We need to repair what has happened and then we still haven't, obviously. And that's part of the atrocity of what I think this situation hate lends to. That the fact that way back when, 1918, a massacre happened and they just called it a lynching. And that is not a big enough word yeah. <laughs> for what it was. And it reached her and, and reached the community as a whole country. Like that's just the significance of this happening in 1918 alone, just the, the the growth of what that meant and what that was and what that signified for a whole community, for a whole race of people within a country. There's nothing we can say that's how big of an effect it should have. And, and the fact that she did this and the fact that she alone, like it wasn't until you brought her to us, had I ever seen these works. And I'm yeah. so upset. I'm so angry <laughs> <laughs> that it took this long. And, and, and I love that the school... Is it Dan Dan Danforth? Yes, Y'all. That, is it, the art museum at Framingham. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that they actually have realized how valuable this is and trying to collect the pieces to either being donated or gifted so they can display and talk about her works. Like I can't believe that it is 2021 and a woman who lived for 90 years doing all of this amazing work. We haven't talked about it before today. Like, I'm just so upset and not knowing. And then her being that iconic for a huge movement, whether it was for the art world or whether it was for the civil rights movement. Like, Mm -hmm. why? Why are we not talking more about what she did and what she saw and how it impacted her art? But anyway, I'm off my soapbox now. (laughs) (laughs) We like soapbox, Samantha. Soapbox, Samantha. That's what we call you. Oh, Lord. (laughs) I'm going to go home now. I'm going to go to bed. (laughs) You are home. (laughs) That's right. I forgot. (laughs) Son of a... (laughs) Yeah, I mean, the power of art. And this episode really did make me miss museums. Yeah. Yeah, it really did. (laughs) Soon, Eve, you'll be crying in a a museum again. I hope so. Soon we shall meet again. Yes. (laughs) Is there anything else that we've missed before we wrap it up here? I think that is it for me. Awesome. Well, where can the good listeners find you? As always, you can find me at Eve Stefko on Twitter. You can find me at Not Apologizing on Instagram. Also on the podcast, This Day in History Class, a daily history show about people like, you know, Mita Vogue, Warwick Fuller, even though we haven't specifically covered her on the show, a lot of other super interesting biographies and events that happened that you may want to learn about or may want to learn a little bit more about. And also the show Unpopular, which is about people in history who really booked traditions, booked norms, and were persecuted for it and how their stories played out and the importance of those. And that is what I got. (laughs) (laughs) You can also find Eves on this very show, clearly. I think we've done like... Oh, yeah. Maybe 10 of these now? Yeah. No, I think it's more. Oh, yeah? It's more, yeah. Shut the front door. Have we had our year I think it's like anniversary? It's been over a year. Oh, what? Wow. Yeah. Over we missed it. Son of a We got to have a, a belated celebration. Yes. I don't know how. <laughs> I'm actually checking the number right. 
Oh, uh, 19. 19 <gasps> of them. Yeah. So, okay, so we've done 19 at 20. We'll have to do something. Okay. I don't okay, know what. The next episode. Yes. Yes, All yes, right. yes. For awesome. Awesome. Everybody, everybody gets a cupcake? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> everybody gets a cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I celebrate. I was thinking of silly hats. I don't know. And we clearly go in different. Oh, I celebrate with fattening food. The directions <laughs> here. But we've got time to work it out. I feel like in one of the very first episodes we did, Eve, we were talking about getting champagne and cheesecake. I cheesecake. can't recall why. We were. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why cheesecake either. Cheesecake was the big talk because I love cheesecake. Yes. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm here for it. I like cheesecake too. I'm just saying. <laughs> so, yeah, we had a big discussion about cheesecake and how much I love it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, we can figure this out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the meantime, listeners, if you would like to contact us, you can. Our email is stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can also find us on Twitter at momstuffpodcast or on Instagram at Stuff Never Told You. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina. Thank you, Christina. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 